Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Wabbit Magic. Rest in peace, Alan. On this episode of DTNS, Google explains why its search was telling you to glue cheese to a pizza. Meta rolls out Threads Deck, its Tweet Deck clone. And Chris Mancini joins us to talk about how AI generated books are affecting him as an independent publisher. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 31st, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, writer and podcaster, Chris Mancini. Welcome back. Yay, thanks for having me, guys. Hey, thanks for coming back. Uh, it is good to talk to you. Uh, we got some AI topics to kick around. We got some other stuff to kick around. But let's start by kicking around the quick hits. Reuters sources say TikTok's executives talked in an all-hands meeting about a project to separate its algorithm in the U.S. from the rest of the world. TikTok posted on X that the story is misleading and factually inaccurate and told The Verge that the report that the code is being split is 100% false. TikTok has until January 19th to either get the law overturned in court or sell off its U.S. version of TikTok or Facebook <laughs> face a ban on distribution of TikTok in the U.S. altogether. In a document created on October 19th, 2020, the U.S. National Security Agency, the NSA, recommended several ways to protect phones from security threats. One of them is to turn off the phone at least once a week in order to prevent zero-click exploits and spear phishing attacks. PC World wrote an article about the practice on May 17th, just earlier, you know, a couple weeks ago, and updated it last Thursday. Then Forbes picked up the story and ran it Thursday. And now it seems like every local news outlet in the United States is running it as well. Uh, it's not a new document, uh, but it's newly discovered by many people. Uh, but it's not bad advice either. Uh, some zero-click exploits can happen by text message and don't require any interaction from you, but they can stay resident on the phone uh, until you reboot. But once you reboot, they're gone. Spotify will now refund owners for car thing. That was the $90 hardware device that allowed users to stream Spotify in their cars set to be bricked on December 9th. Spotify started emailing car things owners that their devices would soon stop working via email on May 24th at the time didn't guarantee refunds and people were like, what? I, are you kidding? <laughs> Ars Technica confirmed Thursday that Spotify has indeed started a refund process. Two studies are getting a lot of attention today, and they were both published in the journal Science. One is from scientists at Ben-Gurion University and Northwestern University. They studied more than 664,000 voters and their activity on Twitter during the 2020 election. They found that a small percentage of users accounted for a large majority of the false information being spread about the election. While they could tell the accounts were not probably automated, it is possible they were paid by organizations, something called sock puppets, but it may not matter because the other study published in the journal Science from MIT found that during COVID, mainstream stories about negative effects of vaccines had more influence on people than outright false information. So here's an example. Mainstream story from the Chicago Tribune had the headline, a healthy doctor died two weeks after getting a COVID vaccine. CDC is investigating and why. Nothing factually inaccurate, but it's possible that people would be misled into believing that there is more danger than the story says. It's possible that misinformation spread was not all that effective, uh, and the swaying of public opinion might still remain the province of mainstream media. The Wall Street Journal's uh, uh, Alina Disick has an anecdotal story about restaurants around the U.S. moving away from QR codes as menus. The practice was very common uh, after lockdowns as a way to prevent circulation of items people touched. However, many restaurants are back to printed menus. Some are keeping the QR codes for additional information. For example, Flower and Water in San Francisco has a QR code on the printed menu that offers diners tasting notes for the wine list. Just 
for reference, flower and water is like an expensive kind of place that you would uh, have pizza at. And one use of QR codes seems to remain popular. That's being able to pay your bill without having to call a waiter or a head to the counter. I'm, I'm all for QR codes not being the menu, uh, but I do like paying. I do like like paying by QR code. Chris, do you do you do that? Do you like the the QR code thing? I do. It's actually easier and quicker to do the QR code if when it works. Yeah, when it works, <laughs> and uh, it's working more often, but still not all, all the yes. time. Uh, all right, VP and head of Google Search Liz Reed wrote a blog post describing how Google is addressing the odd results in AI overviews. AI overviews is the summary response to your search query that appears at the top above the usual list of links. You know, like uh, use non-toxic glue to add, uh, make sure your cheese sticks to the pizza. First off, she pointed out that the AI overviews are not as inaccurate as you might think based on the headlines. The percentage of odd and inaccurate answers is very low in the less than 1% category, but there are billions of people using Google, so there's hundreds of examples. Some screenshots were faked, so you may have seen some AI overviews that weren't actually things that happened in Google. Also, she wrote that it is not hallucinating. Uh, hallucinating is is the term you use when ChatGPT just makes something up and you, you know it's not true. Uh, AI overviews does use a large language model, but it is combined with actual high-ranked search results. So it has links to everything it says. Okay. So knowing all of this, why does this still fail sometimes? So we actually went through an article that supposed why it would be failing on Daily Tech News Show previously. And what Reed wrote was actually pretty close to this. Uh, misinterpreting queries. My, my example, the last time we talked about this was meaning Sarah Lane, the excellent podcaster, but then having AI overviews tell you about Sarah Lane, the ballerina, right? Uh, it just can't always tell the difference between things that sound or spelled the same. Misinterpreting a nuance of language. So satire is a big tripping point. It doesn't understand when you're joking uh, and not having a lot of great information to choose from. If there aren't great sources for it in the high ranked web pages, it's just going to pick what's available. And maybe that isn't very good. Uh, a combo example of that was the famous, how many rocks should I eat? And AI overviews telling you, you should, <laughs> doctors recommend you eat one a day because it didn't have a lot of high ranking answers to a question that nobody really asks. And the one it did have was from The Onion. Uh, and it didn't know that the onion was satire, so it cited it as real. Okay, so so what AI do we can't do? learn that the onion is satire. <laughs> AI is I mean, really AI bad should, at telling satire. Know that, yeah. but yeah. in this case, obviously, it didn't know that. Yeah. It's yeah, one you... of our advantages, Chris, is that we still can tell satire. <laughs> That'll humans, help us beat humans. the robots. Yeah. Okay, but uh, <laughs> assuming that you know we're going to figure out how AI is better going forward, how do we fix what's broken? Okay, here's what they say they're doing to fix it. Uh, they are limiting the use of user-generated content in the answers. So a lot of the stuff, yes, there's the Onion article that's famous, but there were also Reddit posts where people were giving joking answers, and again, it couldn't tell it was joking. So they're cutting down on the user-generated content that it relies on. They are adding restrictions on queries that Google has identified as not returning helpful answers. That's just some manual tuning that they have to do. And they are expanding the restrictions on summarizing health info. Uh, you may not have realized they don't summarize hard news at all. They were restricted on what health info they would summarize, and they're going to increase those restrictions. So there's less of a chance of getting bad health info. Okay. So do we Because think... the internet is full of great health info, too. I mean, anytime <laughs> no, no, you have yeah. a symptom, yeah. you type it in like, oh, I'm dying. Okay. Yeah, I get a lot yeah. of it from the onion. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, you know, best well, of luck there, two, Tom. Two rocks but, a day but... keeps the satire away. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But, but even for anybody who's sort of like, okay, I can filter out some of these like silly answers, do we think that this new uh, 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 way to that AI is going to help humans is going to work? No. <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, Reed does not expect it to be perfect. Actually, it will reduce the number of fake answers. There weren't that many to begin. She's right. Uh, but Reed 
said herself, at the scale of the web, with billions of queries coming in every day, there are bound to be some oddities and errors. All right, Chris, um, knowing uh, what we've told you, <laughs> and obviously, <laughs> you know, you you may have uh, experienced AI in uh, one sense or another, but, you know, where where do you fall on this? Um, probably the same place as Tom. It's it's not ready for prime time. I mean, I, I started seeing that, too, uh, up on my Google searches, and I was just trying to, like, find a video game answer of, like, how to save in a certain game, and it gave me absolutely incorrect information and uh the thing that's frustrating is why can't i just get like a slider or a button like you know shut off ai prompt or, or whatever and then i can just go back to regular searches like you i it's we're being forced fed ai in every aspect and i think that can be toned down a bit yeah, I, I, there are times when I have used the AI overviews because I opted into the beta a long time ago, and, and it hasn't always been bad. Sometimes it's helpful. Uh, I would like to choose <laughs> when, yes. when I want to hear from it and, and when I don't. They did add the web filter now alongside images and news and shopping uh so you can click into that that's that's something but but yeah like i like the idea of a slider or, or something that you can toggle on and off i think that's a good idea yeah so if i want it or i don't want it or maybe some days i want it some days mm -hmm. i don't or can it guess when i want it yes <laughs> <laughs> Well, social networks might be a place where we're all talking about this AI mm, absolutely. thing and yeah. and yeah, and how it works for us. So, rejoice if you're a web thread user as I am. I love a good web <laughs> situation and threads is one of them. Meta is rolling out its new TweetDeck like, not exactly the same, but TweetDeck like column view to all users on threads after announcing the feature in testing earlier this month. Some threads users have nicknames that look threads deck, which lets you pin as much as 100 different feeds to the threads homepage. I've done like five and it's gotten very uh, uh, crowded. So I don't know how you would do a hundred, but okay. Each column can be set to auto update so you can follow new posts as they come in. This might be very advantageous if you're following a specific news story, for example. The new look won't eliminate the For You feed, and some Threads users have never really liked that For You feed. That's the feed that is, it's not following, it's what we think you might like. Um, you can turn it off, but it uh, always comes back uh, every time you log in again. But you can more easily hide it this way by putting your following feed and any other feeds that you're following, whether it be a news topic, a certain person. Maybe I want to just like have Ace Detect be, you know, one of my columns that is now uh, in my control. Um, many TweetDeck users found practical for finding real time information exactly what Threads is going for. But Tom, in our uh, pre-show, you were like, oh, this isn't really a threat. Yeah, I was a big TweetDeck user. Uh, yeah. And I used it for following reactions to my posts. I used it for following friends and family. Uh, and, and the threads thing doesn't really do those things yet. Right. I, I never really used TweetDeck the way a lot of people did, which was following news stories. So being able to do a search and then follow that isn't exactly uh, something I'm looking for. I did pin following and for you next to each other. Um, I think being against the algorithmic feed is just one of those things that's very fashionable to do <laughs> these days. Uh, but a lot of times the for you feed will show you things you would have missed otherwise. Uh, so I, I find value in both for you and following. So that's what I've done. I've pinned those two next to each other. Uh, Chris, I don't know how much you use threads or, or if this is appealing to you. Uh, well, all I know is you can't fight the algorithm, Tom. You know, you can try, but the algorithm's always going to catch up with you. Uh, but I don't really use it as <laughs> as much. Uh, but what I find fascinating about, like, when stories like this come out, it's always like one social media company trying to copy the functionality of another social media company until we're ultimately going to have one that tries to do everything. So, but this is another uh, example of that. Like, oh, well, this works over here. Let's move it over here and call it something else. 
Although you can't get TweetDeck without paying now. So a lot of people moved from X to, to Threads uh, mm -hmm. and kind of missed that the old free TweetDeck uh, that we had. So I, I get the excitement around it. And I certainly get why uh, Instagram would want to mimic it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Honestly, um, I I was not a TweetDeck user. I mean, I used it because I tested it here and there. But um, I wasn't really uh, a, a user of TweetDeck. Um, however, what I think that Threads is trying to replicate, and as you mentioned, Tom, it's not totally the same. But to be able to say, like, all right, you know, give me give me the j j just you know the for you page. Um, then if I want to filter by like, what's the news about orcas in the world? Like, okay, got that, you know, <laughs> that's another column, you know, <laughs> like it's, this is anything that gives you an, uh, ability to customize your experience is a good thing. And threads sort of historically was like, we don't want to give that to you yet we're gonna be like very bare bones you know for a while where people were like okay well <laughs> well yeah because they were just getting started there and and yeah I, that, that's why i don't want to hate on the the threads deck you know limited functionality too much because i assume they will add more features as they go along right yeah they don't want to spoil you up front either <laughs> <laughs> They're just a small company, Chris. Yeah, they, you yeah. know, give them a chance. Yeah, you got to take you time. Know? They've got a lot of one beta tester in a basement. That's all they have. That's all but, they got. You know, but, and the three billion users on Facebook, but they don't all use Threads yet. So, but I thought that this would be a good opportunity to uh, go around the horn about what we do like as far as filtered news. You know, when you, you know, you fire up your social network of choice, what do you want to, you know, see? And then what do you want to drill down into? Chris? That's inter an interesting question. I deliberately make sure I avoid news on social media because it's a, um, you know, it's it's a trap. Uh, so uh, because if, if you get one polarizing article, then there's like a thousand comments after it or people fighting back and forth. And it's one of the things I actually avoid on like when I want news, I'll go to a specific news site. Uh, but I actually, and if somebody is super political on social media, I like mute or, or, or turn them off because it's, um, you could go down a bad rabbit hole very quickly with news on social media for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. Uh, I don't, I actively do not consume news on X or threads uh, or Mastodon in my feed. I, I go to my feed to see what people are talking about. Uh, and I, I will occasionally search. I will search to be like, okay, I want to know if people are, you know, have found anything about this particular story. But I, I'm, I'm like Chris. I, I go directly to particular news sources that I curate very closely and 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 feel like I can rely on, just just to avoid that thing that we were talking about in the quick hits, where where you're just seeing a bunch of stuff that's not reliable. Right. Yeah. How about yeah. you, and, Sarah? What do you do? And then, oh, and then I was going to say also, we do search to see, like, if you're on social media, wait, is that celebrity really dead? Then that's our, our, <laughs> yes, our search. Right. Did they post recently? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you use it yeah. for news, though? Uh, do I? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Um, at the same time, uh, just because of the nature of, I think, how we all probably operate uh news wise and we talked about this a little bit on yesterday's show uh with uh rob dunwood and justin robert young um i i i just simply can't i can't deal with it first thing in the morning you know i have to you know <laughs> you know, feed myself walk my dog uh do tech news and keep it focused um but afterwards I do like, I like what Threads is doing as far as giving me options to consume news in a different way, rather than like a one trick pony, uh, you know, feed. Okay, I can make this a little bit more customized. I like that. 
Well, it's not news, but you might also like our top five series, Tom's Top Five. Each episode is just 60 seconds. We count down five things, usually in the world of technology or around it. Uh, I've been doing a lot of user-suggested uh, top fives lately. Uh, so go watch them all. Uh, the, you know, 60 seconds a pop. You can watch a bunch of them. They are at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, DTNS Picks, P-I-X on Instagram, and YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. Fast Company has a profile story up on a startup called Naria, uh, founded by some Amazon folks, former Amazon folks. Naria lets parents and kids create custom children's storybooks. So you describe the character, the scenes, uh, and a model will fill out the plot for you. It will also help with illustrations, let you upload your own photos. You can create characters, you know, based on your kids, for your kids to watch uh, or read about. Finished stories can even be printed out as a physical book. And Naria is working with creators to say, well, if people like the characters from your stories, uh, we'll sort of do a revenue share with you to use those characters uh, in kind of a creator-funded model for this. Chris, as an author and independent publisher, these kinds of tools are becoming uh, more frequent, more people are able to just go into chat GPT and say, tell me a story. How do you feel about this? <laughs> the way most artists feel horrified. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because what it does is AI is it's pulling and creating all of these images and uh, these stories. They're pulling from actual work that humans have created. You know, AI is basically a compiling tool of uh, search engine searches. So you know, when you put all these things together and they're talking about revenue sharing, well, what about revenue sharing with the people whose work all of your AI is based on? Uh, you know, at first I was like, oh, maybe they're going to, you know, find out where the AI is getting the source material and then actually see if those creators want a piece. But no, it's the opposite. The <laughs> whatever the AI spits out, then maybe we'll revenue share. And and Narnia, that's pretty close to Narnia, isn't it? For uh, children's mm. stories books. Uh, <laughs> I don't think C.S. Lewis will mind. Yeah, but maybe yeah. Maybe his estate will. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, so uh, it, it sounds like you're very much in the camp of like, this is just exploitative and I don't like it. Yeah, pretty much. And in fact, I was just at a, um, a WGA meeting and uh, for a committee and we were talking about uh, like a presentation for AI, you know, and, and some writers are using them as tools to generate ideas. And a lot of the ideas generated by AI are terrible. And, uh, you know, they're, they're like the hackiest premises you could type. like, you know, you type in what you want, and then it gives you the, the weirdest, hackiest premise you could come up with, which I guess is saving some of the hackier writers time i'm not sure but uh uh the main complaint and why the writers and artists went on uh, and actors went on strike and also why comic book artists everybody's really not happy with this is be mainly because the it's just pulling from work already created by people and if there's a way to label things if there's a way to compensate the creators that these new works are being based on, you know, maybe there's a middle ground somewhere, but we're not there yet. There's there's a, a lot of ground that still needs to be covered. And it's a difficult question because, you know, the way these algorithms work, they don't copy or store the work. They use the work to figure out what are the relationships between words and then they have a relational database based on that learning. So, you know, it's it's not as clear as a copying situation, right? It's it's very very difficult uh, to take existing law and apply it. Uh, it's one of the reasons I have been saying like we need we need new rules around how sure. all of this works. And it's uh, you know what you just said it is also very true for um, you know images that artists draw and pages and illustrations and all of those things. It's yeah, not yeah. just copying something from like The Hobbit or anything like that. But you know if you put well show me a demon with a wizard in a uh, on a <laughs> you know on a rock bridge I'm like you know it's probably going to look close to Gandalf and the Balrog. But but, uh, uh, you know, you have all of these, you know, rules in place like, well, AI can't copyright. You can't copyright work made by AI. It still has to be copyrighted by a person. But like you said, we need new rules. Well, what about hybrid things that are created? And what about databases? And what about a book that gets published that was made solely through yeah. AI? Like all of these things need to be still addressed. And like I said, the writers and artists are the uh, writers and actors when they went on strike, they addressed some of it, but there's still ground to cover, like I said. 
Do you find any of these generative models useful in, in any of the work you're doing? You know what? It's um, not yet, uh, and like, uh, but I, I'm sure I will at some point because, like, when we make um, things called pitch decks for movies and TV shows, these are like internal documents that can kind of create a mood, and they were often generated um, internally for just for pitch purposes. It's going to streamline stuff like that very quickly. So there are certain tools. Uh, that can definitely be really uh, useful. Now, as far as like the actual writing, like brainstorming and stuff, I mean, there's kind of tools already, but ultimately at the end of the day, if you're an artist, you still have to do, do the work yourself. Yeah, the Wall Street Journal, uh, Joanna Stern and a couple of the other reporters there did a, a test of all the current uh, generative models. Uh, and one of the things they found it was worst at was creative writing. They're like, it's it's really <laughs> yeah. good at financial stuff. It's it's mm -hmm. pretty great at coding. It's awful at creative writing. It's yeah, it's, I mean, it's better at business writing, but it's not even that much better. I, I was gonna say, like, you know, I think the first step into that pool is uh, grant writing or something like that, where it's any kind of like business uh, proposal. Yeah, yeah, it's probably it can it can grab and create a little bit easier. I found it uh, the uh, the new model, the ChatGPT model for four point. It's four point oh, not four point zero, yeah. which is yeah, always confusing. Uh, but it it's actually gotten decent at copy editing, so like mm -hmm. finding you know finding typos and and things like that. Which there have been some other programs that have have kind of fine tuned models to be really good at that anyway. Uh, so you can you know your mileage may vary whether Grammarly is just a better option anyway. Yeah, well, that stuff can be super helpful if, like, it can really dial in and, uh, you know, if you have a manuscript or something and you want to just put it through. And then, you know, like, it because as we write, as writers, you don't always see those errors, even though somebody reading it can. Oh, yeah. And then it comes back completely red. I'm like, wait, I, I, I missed half the letters. What, what happened? So. I was putting in my micro stuff in Microsoft Copilot, though, and I would catch it changing things, like rewriting sentences. I'm like, no, I just want you to catch a typo. And I don't yeah. need a full edit. Yeah. 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 Put the apostrophe in can't. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> that's all I want. Don't change it to won't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Fabio responded to Roger's latest two cents column on uh, Patreon about the cinema experience not bringing in expected money these days. Fabio says, this is a worldwide situation. I'm Chilean and there are too many entertainment options that going to the cinema is more trouble than pleasure. At home, we have a good 65-inch 4K TV. Prices are lower every day. A plethora of services. Netflix, Prime Video, Max, Disney+, Plus, Apple TV+, Plus, Crunchyroll, etc. At affordable prices. That's more than anyone can even watch. I'm canceling Disney+, Plus this month. And Max, too, for that reason, says Fabio. Game Pass for games, and so on. Movies... Not for me and the family anymore. Chris, are you going out to the movies? I, I mean, I for years I, I was a guest on your your movie podcast. I'm curious if you're still watching the movies in the theaters. Uh, uh, you know what? I am, but every time I go, it's empty. <laughs> oh so, no, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I am still enjoying the uh, going to the theater. I don't go as much as I used to. Well, obviously, because I don't have a movie podcast anymore. I don't have to go every sure, week anymore. Yeah. But but, you know, it's after the pandemic as the recovery of the movie theaters was very, very slow. But, you know, despite whatever the CEO of AMC says, it's not where it used to be and it may never get there again. Uh, but uh, it's still an enjoyable experience. And it's one of those things where, you know, the movie theaters have to kind of come up with different ways to make it more compelling and exciting. Like one of the things is the, you know, the, like we talked about before, the Beyonce and the, you know, the touring, like things yeah, like yeah. that, Taylor where Swift people go in Taylor yeah, Swift. Yeah. And uh, but one of the things, too, is like you make the movie experience more compelling. Like when we went to see Dune 2, we waited until we could grab an IMAX screen. And uh -huh. it took we had to wait like I think like two months because it kept selling out over and over again, but it was spectacular. And it's a movie that was shot for a, a massive screen and, and uh, you know, great sound. And, 
you know, I think what you're going to see more is it's it has to be more of an experience to get you to leave your home. Like Fab, Fabio is right. That's not the I can't believe it's not butter, Fabio. That's a different Fabio, right? <laughs> It is. I, don't know. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't know for sure, but yes, I think so. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I think it's one of those things where you make it interesting and you make it different and you make it like more of an event that you can experience at home, like a giant IMAX screen, like a, um, a concert where you're around a bunch of screaming fans like yourself. And, you know, you have it more of a community event, like, you know, horror movies were always the big community thing. Like you go and you get scared. Of course, yeah. Your you're feeding off everyone yeah. else's yeah, yeah. yeah reaction. So I, I think it's you know movie theaters have to still figure that out a little bit more like what's making it more interesting to come here than to stay home well chris mancini um we will continue this conversation with you in gdi uh but Excellent. for now let folks know where they can keep up with everything that you do Absolutely. That is uh, whitecatentertainment.com. You can get podcasts, graphic novels, and uh, some books. And the one podcast that we're um, growing and uh, promoting right now is The Quiet Journeys of Professor Atwood. It's a storytelling comedy podcast that helps you kind of lower anxiety and helps you go to sleep. Uh, I've been told I make people go to sleep with my voice, so I leaned into it. And uh, now I'm doing it on purpose. So, Aww, uh, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Uh, but awesome. it, it's isn't that weird that, like, you know, I think, you know, especially in this country, people might need something that uh, maybe lower anxiety a little bit. Can't so, I, I, why, but, yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to create something Never that would help. Never had anxiety <laughs> myself. <laughs> so I, I wanted to create something that was like that did all the work for you. There's no breathing exercises. It just tells funny, silly stories where you can relax your music and sound design and just kind of lower the temperature or go to sleep. Indeed. Uh, well, good. Well, we're going to keep talking to Chris, like uh, Sarah said. And it's Friday, so a good day internet is our place to do some fun Friday stuff. And Roger has put together another round of the great GDI debates. We're going to debate ebooks versus paper books. The best all female 80s band and no expense spared taste experience versus super cheap eats. What is your priority? Stick around for that. Just a reminder, though, you can catch our show live. DTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you all have a real nice weekend. We're back on Monday discussing if YouTube is an entirely new category of entertainment with Shannon Morse joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host Rob Dunwood. Video producer Joe Kuntz. Producer at large Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods! Beatmaster, W's Goddess One, BioCal, Captain Gipper, Steve Godorama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. A Gadget Virtuoso and JD Galloway. Modern video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Scott Johnson and Justin Robert Young, and our guests this week were Charlotte Henry and Chris Mancini. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>